What are your general perception of the creative art industry at the moment? And you know, what are we doing right? What could do better? Or you know, um, how can things get better? How much are we looking from the IMF again? Three billion. And here is an industry that's going to make uh, 4.3 billion. What are the key influences or the things that influenced you to, to become a politician? I mean, they found in me a young, um, insightful and experienced. Who found in you? My community. It was a resounding call. How does that feed into the whole narrative and perception that politicians can't be trusted? Well, if there's a particular place to make a lot of money, it would have in the private sector. Do we have a positive outlook for 2023? I doubt even if the party people, the keen supporters of the current government, have a positive outlook. Resigning and trying to take himself away from them is, isn't going to help him. Good evening, and you're watching The Hard Truth. Now, today, we'll be having a conversation with a young gentleman who has made quite an impact in the entertainment industry. His legacies include the three music awards, three music TV, Waterland Festival, among others. Now, after five years of leading three music network, he decided to venture into full-time politics. Can he replicate the success in the political arena? Your guests are good as mine. My guest for tonight is the former CEO of Three Music TV Network and founder of the Wilderland Foundation, Baba Sadiq Abdullayabu. You're watching or we'll be discussing political, his political ambitions as well as his perspective on the creative art industry. You are watching The Hard Truth. My name is Nana. Abu, welcome to the Hard Truth. Thank you for having but, me. But you know, you and I, what happened to us? Birthday, 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 um, there's a whole channel that can take on more than 30 minutes of content. But so, I'm proud of you, you know. Thank you. Welcome thank you to the heart rate again. Thank you. Now, you resigned a little over three months ago after leading Three Music Network for five years. Just right. tell me bluntly, uh, what have you been up to since your resignation? Well, I, uh, I've been up to two things. Um, one, um, doing a lot of engagement in my constituency um, ahead of the prime minister, internal prime minister of the party. Um, aside also working on the Waterland Foundation. Mm. Um, there's a bit of a connect with what Waterland Foundation does um, and politics. It also relates to governance in a certain level, uh, but as it relates more to um, climate change and clean climate future. Mm. You know, so in the past um, few months, this is what I've been quietly working in the background on. I see, but, but you obviously found the Three Music Network, and even though yeah. you have resigned, you still have a role to play, uh, you know, behind the scenes. I yeah. just want to know whether it's just fully resignation or, you know, behind the scenes that something's going on or you've taken your hands off completely. <laughs> well, I've, I've stepped down from management. Uh, I'm still associated with Three Music, uh, but <clears throat> there's, a, there's a fantastic team that I've um, currently continuing with uh, whatever we started. Um, the CEO is an experienced uh, new truck, are you, Rashida. Are you, are you related to Shichesh Abdullah? Is your sister or relative? I, I consider her as a sister, but yeah, you know, but but when we were not related, we we're not related. It's just sheer coincidence that we, we share the same. Share the same what are your expectations of her? Well, I mean, obviously the future of 3 Music, having built the brand and established a lot of the assets that's would uh, would bring or or tend into be tending to profit. The expectation will be to, for her to take it to the next level. The mm. next level of the business is obviously commercial returns, mm. you know. And so, and she's got a very solid background um, in commercial management, worked in different industries, yeah, telecommunications, and you know, um, she's majorly worked in telecommunications and internet service um, space. Yeah. But but she's a very hands on and effective manager. But Baba is I know Baba is grandfather. So why Baba? Your name Baba is it? All, for where you come from, what does it mean? No Baba. Is Baba means father. 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 Yeah. So, so I was very, actually named after my grandfather. I see. You know, and so my dad and his siblings, out of respect for their 
father and the fact that they couldn't just call me Abu Bakr Sadiq, just so call Baba me Sadiq. Sadiq. Yeah. I see, but I like it. But yeah. one of your legacies again, I think, is it's the Wilderland Festival. The, the first edition was fairly successful. In, in actual fact. In, uh, 2021. Uh, you know, yeah, the second edition was scheduled in December and was cancelled. What caused the cancellation? In actual fact, um, Wilderland Festival runs under different um, organization. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know, I mean, for a lot of people, so because I'm involved in it, the thinking has been that they are all the same. So Three Music TV, uh, the, the prayer company or the corporate organization is Three Media Networks Limited, uh, which is a different organization from Waterland Foundation and Maverick, which runs um, Waterland Festival. Right. Yeah, and it's where... cancellation. What, what, what led to that? 2021 was fantastic. You cancelled in 2022. Why? Uh, well, I mean, uh, one of the stakeholders, um, I, th I, don't, I think we couldn't um, agree on time with one of the stakeholders. There are a number of um, things that we needed to scale over. Um, in this case, the Forestry Commission. And so at the time when um, we were having to quickly go over it, there wasn't enough time to effectively do that. And so... But um, you started working on this thing, you know, in January and, you know, just in October there about August. Well, like, well, there was a stalemate. Um, stalemate regarding... Um, some aspect of the cost, you know, and so you would realize that it, it will require some bit of negotiations and conversations. But but again, One, <laughs> Baba, could your exit have negatively affected it? You know, the execution of the of the second edition. Do you think you exiting uh, you know, also affected it? No, and as I indicated to you, um, even though I've left Three Media Networks Limited at the CEO, mm. I'm still having to develop and run with Waterland Foundation, which runs the Waterland Festival. You know, and so um, I still have a bit of um, a supervisory role on that in terms of all these regulatory and intergovernmental organization engagements and all of that. And so it, it didn't quite affect it. It, it, it. it was just one of those things where I don't think the, the organization we're dealing with saw the value of the festival beyond yeah. monetary terms. Yeah. You know, and that was a bit hard for us that were making, looking to make some bit of investments. Also because Waterland Festival was not the commercial events as it were. And, you know, it was an event that's also meant to amplify issues in and around ESGs, environmental, social and governance, and particularly environmental. Right, but you know. aside the festival, other events such as the, you know, uh, Travelverse Festival and the uh, Case Daniels concert were all cancelled. And this is not a healthy training name, is that is it? Well, it's not, uh, but I, I mean, I don't know if the issues are peculiar, you know. Um, um, everybody has got their issues. At this point, one can draw a particular conclusion regarding why these events did cancel. Um, because, I mean, we don't know what what issues they had to deal with. But in our case, the Forestry Commission in this case was a very major stakeholder. You know, the, the festival itself happens at the non-consumptive area of a forest reserve, mm. you know, and so... So what, what did they say? They were not interested anymore? Well, it wasn't much of they wasn't interested. I think that we, were, we took a different instance to their proposal for... What, what was it? I'm interested because well, many I mean, people a, were looking forward to the festival. Well, it was payments. It was payments. I mean, the first commission wanted a certain amount of money and it was our second year having taken a huge risk in year one and we didn't have that for was it a, a partnership with them or no it wasn't a part in fact the partnership would have been ideal for us because we counter proposed the partnership mm. you know which would have been very good for how much were they asking for well i think for confidentiality purposes it would be difficult to have to put that Give out me a range how much were they asking for because <laughs> that would help us understand a very good program that was organized in 2021 and then you know for some reason unknown to the public you just tell us duty financial whatever you know it couldn't happen again how much? Well, this is about uh, 100,000 cities, you know. Um, and but and you couldn't afford 100,000 It wasn't a matter of we couldn't afford 100,000 mm -hmm. cities. It was the circumstances that the, the festival was just How much into. were you going to make from that? The this, year, this year, so last year we had gone in deep, I mean, and made a lot of um, acquisitions, assets that were going to use to work for this year because this year we didn't have the kind of budget we started year one with. Couldn't you arrange for installment payments? You know, it's Christmas. People were coming from all over the world. We're it, expecting that festival to happen. It couldn't have been possible. It would have impacted us one way or the other. Look, 
when you're building festivals, when you're building properties of this nature, it takes time for it to begin to show some bit of returns. And so definitely yeah. when you go into year one where you take a major hit over 70% in year two, you would want to mitigate the costs of mm. the festival just so you can build brand equity, continue to build brand equity till the time when the property or the festival will begin to make some returns. You know, and so in year two, um, we also knew that we had to mitigate the cost of the festival because if in year one you had gone in heavy and had, I mean, a negative How much return on 70%. How did we make in year one? Year one, we made only about, what, 25% of the total that we put into the Which is how much? Well, we put in, I think, a total of about $2 million mm -hmm. for the festival. Mm -hmm. You know, and we made just about 25%. I mean, not healthy. And so definitely for every organization, if you had con you must continue profit, on right. that path At least break and even. to build mm. the brand. In fact, in year two, we're not looking to actually break even. Mm. You know, we're just looking to mitigate the cost. And so definitely in year two, we're not going to spend that $2 million. We're not going to even spend, a, I mean, a quarter or half of that. You know, it was very, very less. And we're looking to reposition the festival very well, also because of the silver lining of purpose the festival had um, towards, I mean, and its commitment to clean climate future. You know, and so suffice to say that we didn't have that kind of budget, but um, the total cost also included, the total cost of year two also included the assets that some of the two million investment that had gone into year one had helped us to build. You know, so for instance, we own the tents, mm. the tents that everybody saw us use, there over 600 tents, we own all of them. It sits at the Forestry Commission. And so we made an argument to the organization to say that, look, there's a lot of value or benefits the festival brings, mm. you know, because we realized that after year one, um, the visitations to the Shire Forest Reserve went up 100%, you know, which meant that one of the things that they needed to unlock the potential of the of that eco tourism eco tourism um, eco destination was huge marketing and advertising, and that's one of the values the Wilderland Festival brought to hmm. the Echo Destination. Yeah. Um, beyond that as well, um, the tents. We knew the reserve, for instance, was hard camp with, with certain level of, they needed a number of tents that are beyond oh. the three luxurious tents that they had. And so we, we initially wanted to make a proposal to them to say, look, we've acquired this tent. We could leave some of these tents for you, for you to use throughout the year. Yeah. That was well, the second layer. The whole time. Yeah. That was the second I, layer right. of the value that we offered. And then there was another counter value to say, look, if it was really about money, we were willing to put down a certain minimal amount down. And then beyond that, um, we could do a certain level of revenue share on per head, you know. But we couldn't agree on this early enough. I mean, I think that there's been some back and forth from the beginning of the year. And then this year, when mm. we picked it up, we wanted to move quickly. The way the festival is designed is such that you need access to the grounds a lot more days before the two yeah. weeks to the festival. But two weeks you know, to three weeks to the like festival. Like I'm saying, the, 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 the festival is a huge deal. It will take a long time, yeah. but I just want us to move on. So the, the current trending issue is uh, the Mick, uh, what's it called? Mick Mills contribution music video, which was shot at the Jubilee House. Uh, there's been a lot of public uproar on this development. What are your thoughts on this and did the presidency air in this direction? I think my thoughts is captured in a tweet that I put out on on Twitter and then obviously on Facebook um, to the fact that uh, I felt the presidency was desiccated by the with the video, you know. And in fact, the whole video raises two main issues. I mean, the desecration of the, of the presidency yeah. Uh, which in this case is our seat of government where the the, the state power is executed. Um, beyond that as well, I felt that the security, the laxity of the security was not a good look for the presidency. You know, anybody that has been at the presidency before, where anybody, whether in the previous government or now, which would tell you how you'd got to go to certain security protocols and checks to get to where they were. You know, it seems like it was laxed. Right. And then beyond the laxity of But it, some also argue that, you know, you go to White House and you take shots of White House and all that, they'd be allowed they to do that. They have that. Beyond the make-believe White House studios that they see in Hollywood, they should point to a single time that somebody had gone to White House, proper White House, not what you see in Hollywood movies, 
to take a video. So again, did in the, the ways that it appeared, air, did they air the president? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think that they aired. I mean, the seat of power is a serious one, um, and must always be projected in a certain way. Look, the president's electing is where he delivers some of his most serious speeches to the nation and to his citizens. I mean, to see a hip hop artist just play around with electing uh, isn't the best. There's a reason the president's electing is moved around for only him. And then obviously beyond everything else, the president is the number one citizen of the country. The president, there's a reason we, we put at the expense of the presidency, the country, when I say we Ghana, put at the expense of the presidency, the most qualified and experienced security and what state handlers. All of that is supposed to prevent some of these things from happening. You know, and then there's something that actually so defines what set our state. Do you ever see uh, a Ghanaian actress also, you know, being given that same opportunity to, to do I mean, to, to what extent, to yeah. be honest, you know, um, I think that, I mean, a certain sense of nationalism by all of us would, would, would compel us to want to protect the presidency at any point in time, um, including protecting it from ridicule or protecting it from uh, being being showcased in very, very unserious ways, you know, on becoming of a presidency. Yeah. You know, and so, I mean, in the ways that it appeared, and if you listen to the content of the song itself, which has a lot of hate speech, violence, gun violence, and all of that, it certainly would raise a lot of eyebrows if, um, if you're we, we very... We have been okay if we had a, you know, a gospel... Artists, not even a gospel there. artist. Not okay. even a gospel artist. It's, no, it's, that's it's, the point. Obviously, it's the. It's, we don't it's joke the, with the Jubilee House. We don't joke the with Jubilee House. House is right. where there's yeah. a reason. There's a reason when you go to a certain part of the Jubilee House, you see a sign that says that no photography. No Look, last year there was a there was a group of demonstrators that wanted to demonstrate and just pass in front of the presidency. These demonstrators were stopped. Why? Because they said the presidency was a security installation, and that couldn't have happened there. So in this instance, what changed, hmm. you know? And so, you know, you're a content producer as well. If you go to the independent square and want to take um, um, a shorts or shorts for production, you know the protocols you would have to go through. Hmm. You'd have to go to the Ministry of Information, Information Services Department. When you are done actually even getting the paper, there are national security operatives stationed there. You'd have to go and show it to them. They would have to pass it or sign it off before you can actually film it. But for the presidency, to allow a drone to be flown over the presidency for a shot to be added to a hip hop video. That That's a no -no. must be. That's a no no. I mean, the worst security breach, presidential security breaches we've seen in a long time. Hmm. You know, and so that for yeah. me was not on. And so it raises a lot of questions. And I think that at this point, um, I mean, people in charge of security or managing the president, there has to be a lot of answers regarding how this was a, was made to, was allowed to happen mm. you know now in broadening the conversation what are your <coughs> general perception of the creative art industry at the moment and you know what are we doing right what could do better or you know um, how can things get better well the Ghanaian creative economy is green um, we're still getting a lot of structures in place um, one of the key things that has I mean obviously when we talk about structures you're talking about the laws you're talking about policies and then you talk about the organizations and human resources that are working in the industry. Um, I think that at, at this time, we've got a lot of human resources in the industry that are experienced, that are exposed, that have got the insights to be able to run creative projects or enterprises. Um, um, beyond that, um, there are a number of laws, chief among it as the creative industry bill that has been passed over two years ago, which is meant to give industry a certain sense of structure. Um, it's sad that that particular hasn't has not been is yet to be executed. Also, obviously due to lack of funds, as has been explained in the last few months. Um, but it's growing mm. and it's got great potential. Um, we hear fact, that a lot. We hear that, but Ghana is currently experiencing a golden era uh, yeah. of events, and we have assumed the position uh, in the world as a holiday maker, so make us destination yeah. in, in December every year. Uh, what is your assessment generally at the moment of this development, and uh, is the industry taking opportunity of this situation? Well, I think it's great, and that, that's where I was heading to, trying to analyze the industry very well. Um, um, as it stands now, I mean, of course, it's great news that Ghana um, is 
has the position as a holiday makers um, 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 what's it called? holiday makers um, country okay. every year. I mean, it's a lot of countries are spending a lot of money to be able to gain this attention, and we have that attention. So we can we quantify uh, how much we make every year? You know, well, from the ministry, so the ministry projects that they're looking to have what two hundred and fifty thousand people coming towards the last quarter. I mean, obviously, with a heavy chunk of them in December, and the expectation is two billion dollars. Um, in fact, by twenty twenty five, as a nation, the country is meant to make four point three billion dollars from tourism and it's related culture and creative industries, all of these are connected. You know, 4.3 billion is significant enough. I mean, if you look at it, as a stance now, our hydrogen carbon resources delivers just about, what, 4 billion? And, you know, um, and which, which, which is first, no, which is, which is second beyond aside agriculture, you know? And so if tourism is number three, working to be number one in 2025, that's very significant. And 4. $3 billion yeah, is given. And how much are we looking from the IMF again? $3 billion. <laughs> And here's an industry that's meant to make uh, $4.3 billion. And that's on paper. Let's see how it goes. Which means that. But, but. No, but it's, it's, if you look at the year, year uh, the growth year on year, um, in terms of the activities, in terms of uh, what we've been doing and how we're looking to expand and even export creative content, it's, it's within reach. It's we just good. need to put in certain things to unlock it. It's looking all. good now. So, so what are your, your, your experience, again, the shortcomings, you know, in the industry? And are we exploiting this golden era of events and how do we deal with them? Well, we are. Um, funding is a very major problem. Um, if you look at the size of the market in terms of what everybody takes a pie of, it's just about 300 million cities. I mean, in the last estimation that was done about, what, more than five years or six years back, uh, that's about 300 million cities and this 300 million cities keeps decreasing also because of two things you know there are regulatory reasons as well that's helping to shrink it and then mm. there are what what other reasons i mean uh, technology a lot of things it's helping to shrink it on regulatory i mean laws from the regulators like fda betting companies continues to take money away from industry mm. you know um, of course, the intention behind some of these laws are good we witnessed, to protect society. Uh, you know, a disastrous live, a whiskey like concert, the cancellation of the Kiss Daniel concert, I said that earlier, the Wadalong Festival, and, you know, all these other things. Are we becoming complacent? Because all these things will add up. So are we becoming complacent? No. I mean, on on the top of it, you would see the cancellations, but at the back, it's an entire ecosystem, an entire economic system that has been built at the back of it. I mean, there was a whole lot of people that worked on the Westgate Live events. I mean, off the top of my head, if you look at it, it could be more than 700 people that worked on the event, that got paid for the event, and whoever made that investment pumped like money directly into the economy. You know, so yes, I know the ways the media highlights things There'll be a lot of focus on the fronts, the disappointments of fans paying and not seeing whiskey and all the issues it came with. Isn't that the end but goal? These are I mean, systems. you don't you don't work for seven hundred people. You're working for millions and thousands of people to come and watch. So that's a big deal. Buying ticket to see a concert. Is of, a of big deal. Co I mean, of course, it's a big yeah. deal. Though. And then, I mean, going forward, these are some of the regrettable things that uh, must change in terms of when we make promises as industry people to fans and consumers, we should be able to adhere to it as a way of inspiring confidence in the consumer. Coming back again at you, uh, the, the festival you knew at a point wasn't going to happen. So why didn't you just make a statement somewhere in June and say, well, we're not going to have it, but well, in have June, fans wait till you know you come and June, tell us. June was still a long it. time to just put out a statement. I mean, and But you knew it wasn't festival. going to happen. You knew. I, no. In, as, at, as, at, as at June, you wouldn't have known that the festival wasn't going to happen, you know. Um, and of course, even as at August or September, October, you wouldn't know it wasn't going to happen because you're in conversation with the venue owner, you know. And so if the venue owner um, delays in the response or initially you differ with the proposal they come with in terms of how they're looking to charge you and there was counter proposals and back and forth, you wouldn't have known. But immediately when we knew that it wasn't obvious that this couldn't be pulled off beyond because for the festival, even if we had access to the grounds a month to the festival. It wasn't going to be possible. It was going to be possible. You knew it. But two weeks to the festival, well, it was a stretch, but we're looking to make it work. But eight days to the festival definitely wasn't a good time. So we put out a statement immediately, and then you just engage in the refunds, 
and you begin to re-strategize for subsequent events. As it stands now, the team is busily working trying to activate Tanzania. Then we can think of Ghana if the conditions are favorable. That's not fair, but you're still watching the hard truth. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You are still watching The Hard Truth, uh, former Chief Executive Officer of 3 Music Network, uh, Baba Abdullah Sadiq. Uh, my, my sister knows, so Baba, Baba Sadiq, Sadiq Abdullah Abu. Abu. Right. Okay, so here. Yeah. Well, you just that, simply say Baba Sadiq. Baba Sadiq, works, that's yeah. fine. Now, in the, I think this year, 2023, the Minister for Education, you know, or the Minister of Education said they had plans to... Uh, you know, open the first ever creative and art senior high school in Ghana. I think it's somewhere in Kumasi. What are your thoughts on this whole thing? Significant, but not so significant. Why? Significant because, I mean, of course, um, a ministry such as the Ministry of Education is now beginning to uh, highlight um, creative education, um, which is which is again obviously for industry mm. and i'm sure it would help to drive the conversation in a certain within certain quarters that will be very good for industry or hopefully will be good for industry but not so significant because really and truly i mean creative arts courses are being taught in almost all the secondary schools that teaches um, arts you know arts is it's, it's creative you know so um, and so for so me, the one reason why I would say, for that. so it the questions I ask, mm. well, perhaps we'd have to wait for them to indicate to us the, the course model or the, the curriculum that will be taught at this particular school. But because when you look at it, um, if it's a secondary school, there's a likelihood they would have to go through the WASI system or the GES system. Mm. And if they have to go through the GES system, there are a lot of arts-related courses that have been taught within the GES or WAIC systems, assistance, not the curriculums. Look, a lot of secondary schools are teaching literature, aren't they? Mm -hmm. They are. A lot of schools are teaching general knowledge in art, GKA, aren't they? They are. A lot of schools are still teaching um, what's called uh, music. I mean, in fact, for a lot of art one classes in a lot of secondary schools, you do literature, music and French, you know. And so these are being taught in these schools. Again, the schools that do home economics are teaching people how to sew, are teaching people basically creative economy um, 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 jobs or things that would help them come out in creative sculpture, um, so clay what, making. Rather we strengthen the this. existing uh, structure than, you know, putting up a new building, is what you're saying? No, for me, the more reason I say it's not so significant is beginning to look like, well, I mean, we, we don't have much to show for Let's the things we something. said we're going to do for your industry. Mm. And so, yeah, let's look Let's at it. Okay, something. we built a secondary school. Let's say it's called a creative school or creative secondary school as a way of, you know, um, having something to stick a claim to. But then again, it's not really so significant because creative courses are being taught in secondary schools already. Moving you know. on to your political ambition, it's no secret that you know, that is the next thing you, you are moving on to. Mm. What are the key influences or the things that influenced you to, to become a politician? Well, I mean, I've always sought to have a silver lining of purpose for everything that I do. Um, I've always had sought to have like a, a social impact angle to everything that I, that I do. And so from the Barca days, in terms of the content, output to three music, you realize that the three music began to have what we call the women's branch, which is to 
amplify issues related to representation um, in the industry, particularly of women. And so um, and all of that was 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 social impact inclined. Um, you see what we did with the industrial development program in terms of having to develop a lot more um, video directors to help enable them run like proper enterprises. You know, so there's always been that in society. I've always done one or two things to enable my society, um, shine a spotlight on the society, or basically just create economic systems that will make everybody thrive. And so I think that... So you're entering into politics to do what exactly to do more of that? To do more of that. Mm. Um, beyond that as well, for my society, it was more or less of a calling. I mean, they found in me a young, um, insightful and experienced... Who found in you? my community, my society. So they I came and said, lead us, Baba. Well, it, it, it was a resounding call from a lot of the younger people in the But you know, while well, many congratulate you on your foray into politics, others have questioned your intention. How do you react to comments that you are entering into politics just to make money? And how does that feed into the whole narrative and perception that politicians can't be trusted? Well, if there's a particular place to make a lot of money, it would have been the private sector. Mm. And I'm involved in the Are private sure? sector. I'm actually an entrepreneur in the private sector. I invest in the media and entertainment industry. You know, and I just spoke to you about how we invested $2 million in the Waterland Festival, for instance. And we've been trying to scale it up. We've been trying to take Waterland Festival on the road. And so definitely... Are you, if there are you was venturing a place, into politics to make money? If there was a private place, sector, but are you venturing to make if money? If there was a place to make more money, we would have been in the private sector and mm. not public but, service. But can we trust you, know, you as a politician? Can people trust you as a politician? Obviously, you can You can base it on my excellence. I've always been um, one to stick, to one to push to try to um, leave legacies. Mm. I mean, I've basically worked in industries where I've put in a lot more money. You know, if it was really majorly about money, I, I would probably have saved some of these monies or investment or, or funds that went to or capital that how, went to. How do you make your investments. money again? How do you make money? Two million. I mean, for my worth. enterprises and obviously investors. As an entrepreneur, as a private person, what are you doing in your own capacity to help uh, the constituency? Well, so my constituency is made up of more than seventy percent. The seventy percent of the the constituent are young people. Um, unemployment is a very major one, and. It's interesting that a lot of the people that are unemployed are people that are looking to learn skills. Mm. So I've been looking to, I've been running some skills-based initiatives to try to train younger people in the constituency, particularly those that are not necessarily looking for white-collar jobs, <laughs> to learn a skill or two, and then helping to set them up, right. you know, to start or to be able to create a sustainable livelihood for themselves. Now, this is one of the things that I look to scale up. Again, using art, I've been trying to create economic systems with different, different things. Every year, every seller, I create the Father Marcella Carnival. There's the Homo, thin, uh, Homo Festival. That's that a big deal over there, I'm guessing. That's it's a big, big deal, deal also mm. economically, also because on one night, when there's one activation of Homo, you have no idea the number of vendors that make extra income or extra money mm. from having to work and, 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 and cater to the numbers that come into the constituency during these times. So, but the quite apart from that, there are a number of them that are looking to learn. Um, hairdressing, the number of them that I like to do, learn um, a trade or two, but the limiting barriers is just a little money on what they call on chinsa, you know, and these are some of the things that I've been, I've been doing in my own small way. Your motto was shown in the video you posted on Twitter, uh, it's as, uh, you know, always for the people for development. What is your personal ideology when it comes to development and what would you go uh, to get in the development for your people? You I mean, uh, for me, for development, there are two, there are two things that um, underscores my push for development. Um, one of it is obviously social infrastructure. Um, the other part about it is skills and enabling sustainable life loads for people. So in terms of social infrastructure, um, I, look at, I look out for the things that is needed, that's most important um, to, to enable a very good quality life for my people and when that is lacking i begin to advocate and begin to note it down and are things that i want to push 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 ahead with then obviously with regards to enabling sustainable livelihoods for the people i indicated to you how a number of the young people in my constituencies are without jobs even for those that have are involved in one thing or the other there's certain things certain basic things they need to be able to prep them up and push them for instance grants 
you know, there are a number of women in my constituency. When you map my constituency from um, the Achimoto overhead coming down to um, Abeka Junction, going up through Abeka CMB and coming down. Baba, you, you have obviously have of, your work cut out. I'm, for I'm coming. Let me I, just I get that. No, but I mean, you go on and people. on and on and on. But yeah, I, I just want to know how are you working towards achieving this, and you know what has been the response so far. Well, it's been great. The yeah. grant has been responding to the message that I've been trying to push in, internally from a party, for instance. I've been making a very strong case for them to say that, look, um, when I go around on my journey um, or interactions, this is one thing they always tell me. They tell me that we don't, that's for, that's for the NDC um, activists in the constituency. They tell yeah. me we don't want a PC, we want an MP. You know, and some of them tell me some of the qualities that certain MPs that have come, have had, and for which endear them to the people, for the people to vote for them. And more and more as we interact, as they get to know more about me, these people are able to point out these qualities in me, you know. And so we've been carrying the message to them. We've been carrying the message of a very young, insightful, experienced individual that has been able to do it with uh, the private sector is moving private to, sector, right, and is looking to bring so the same level again, of again, how would you the assess the performance of the current uh, member of parliament um, of the constituency, Honorable Patrick Boama? How would you assess his, his performance? Well, I mean, if if I'm going to look at it, I'll definitely look at it from the two angles that I spoke to you about um, in terms of um, social infrastructure, which um, enables the quality of life for my constituents, and then obviously. Would also look at it in terms of enabling um, sustainable livelihoods for my people. Hmm. I mean, you scan the constituency, you go around talking to the people, these things doesn't seem to be present. I mean, a big constituency as yeah, Okaku Central, for instance, still that doesn't even have anything that could be scaled up into a polyclinic. There isn't. It's a very big urban constituency. Honorable which Patrick is has won his seat three consecutive times, 2012, 16, and 2022, and he won convincingly. Right. So isn't this a confirmation of the people's trust in him and that, you know, can you handle him? Can you beat him? Well, I mean, you can. You never say never to Sadiq or Baba Sadiq. I mean, I've always been up to the task. And so um, as far as campaigning in the constituency, as far as understanding their needs, it's concerned as far as presenting um, a, a, an equally worthy candidate um, to them, or perhaps an even better candidate, youthful, understands so the needs of 70% of the people. You said you don't um, see developments and all of that. So, why, why, why would they vote in for him? Why would they what? Why would they vote in for him? But they everybody have got their okay. reasons. It's, so it's, it's not called a campaign for nothing. I mean, perhaps in the previous years, he just possibly had um, a better campaign in terms of how. He moved around to convince the people, you know. So it's not called a campaign for nothing. But and everybody would have their own reasons of voting. Right. Of course, most of these reasons they will, they will also find in me as well. But beyond that, I think that my idea to enable a sustainable livelihood for them and also drive a very massive social infrastructure uh, and development in the constituency is a superior one. And I'm very very hopeful that. The constituents in the ways that I've been interacting with them, and then the basis of that, right, would vote for me on the basis. I'm interested. What, what would it take to unseat him, and you know, what what do you have to do? Well, I mean, it require a whole lot. Um, it would require an effective campaign. It would require a very. And do you have the people? Yeah. Do you have the the men, the women, the well, I've people got, to back it? One of the things you need to understand is that the NDC party in the Kwaku Central is very strong. Mm. Um, if you notice or you follow the the voter party. It's always been skirt and blouse in the Kwaku Central. It's always been skirt and blouse. It tells you one thing. It tells you that the brand of the party in the Kwaku Central is very strong. It also tells you that the party or the people that the party has in the Kwaku Central are very strong. You know, um, perhaps you're going to find in me um, that candidate they've been waiting for. You're going to find in me the candidate that has all the qualities that have endeared those people that eventually became MPs to the constituents, a candidate that understands the needs of the people, a candidate that was born up from the candidate that was born in the constituency, grew up in the constituency, understands the history of the constituency in terms of development, and understands the needs of the people, particularly the young people and the women in the constituency, and have a, have a, have a, have a, have a, a more compelling plan, you know, for them. And so for me, um, I know that 
It's your the turn. It's your turn. Yeah, it's on just just my <laughs> turn. <laughs> but obviously, it is time for that refreshingly different um, alternative that they've always been waiting for. Let's shift to the NDC. At the moment, what are the party or what about the party motivates you the most as a person? Well, it's social democratic credentials um, and then the concept of comradeship. Mm. You know, um, a social democrat and a party that believes in the concept of comradeship, um, the principle of that is that we are one, regardless of stature, status or symbols. You know, we are one. At the moment, at, at the point where we all converge as a Congress, we are all one. You know, and this is... This Don't is other parties that, do the same, they all is, converge, is, and as a Congress, they are all one. Well, there are some parties that elevate the, the, the rich or a crutch for above everybody else, and that's the party that... And who are those? Who are those that are crutchy people? Well, I mean, it, there's another party in Ghana that believes in the grassroots system where they believe some people are up and top and some people are Who, the grassroots. Which party? That's the NPP. I see. I mean, in terms of the NDC, we don't believe in the concept of the grassroots. We are all one. We are all cadets. We are all comrades. And we all work to achieve um, a collective goal, a collective goal uh, for society. But who was also impressed on you a lot in the NDC? And you look back, you know, when you talk about the NDC, so this person, I look up to this person so much. But the biggest mentor and the biggest um, um, focal point for my love for NDC would always be JJ Rollins. I mean, and looking at him, feeling him, seeing some of the things that he's pushed through with, I mean, would always be um, a focal point um, for somebody that inspired us. And then again, we had during this time when I was also coming up, there were these ones I considered the youngest of the government who had a cool factor. Very intelligent, very smart. Who? Uh, even Chambers. Um, his Excellency John Dramani Mahama, you know, at the time when he came in 96 and was a deputy minister, I mean, from the way he expressed his thoughts, from the way he expressed his understanding of governance and governance related issues, it, it endeared him to me. And I've always been a keen watcher for His Excellency John Dramani Mahama, you know. And so it, I'm really, really glad that I got the opportunity to work with him in 2020 for the 2020 campaign mm. and really look forward to working with him too. I, I, I know him, I know his very good intentions for the state. I know the extent to which he wants to go to be able to develop the country. And right. I know is the extent he, to which is he's that, going. Is he coming back? I mean, is he going to contest? Of anybody? course, there's no any other person that can, <laughs> that can take out the Mixer Celestia John Dramani Mahama. Even if he decides, or even if he says he's not gonna go again, most of us would will move heavens <laughs> to, to ensure that he comes back again. So As it stands now, hard truth. going into 2024. We'll be right back. We'll be right back. <laughs>back you are still watching the hard truth uh baba sadiq is still here baba okay. i want to find out from you what do you see as the weak link of the party and dc uh, you know that needs to be worked on well as it stands out a number of the things that um we had challenges that have, have been fixed i mean the party has been going through reorganization which has been so what you are uh, united now well, I mean, unity is a work in progress. Unity is not something that you just wish, I mean, uh, wish away, or you just make a wish and then it, it comes into place. It requires a lot of work, and that's why I say it's a work in progress. Uh, but most importantly, we've been going through reorganization. Um, it's been the concern of a lot of people that um, a party in the position Reorganizing what? The party structures. I mean, the party has structures from the smaller units of the party at the base of it, you know, um, from the branches coming down to the wards. Now it's going to be known as the zones. 
and then coming to the constituency level, to the regional level, to the national level, you know. And so if you look at it in terms of reorganizing the party and rallying ourselves for victory, that has been happening. I mean, throughout last year, we've gone through all the basic units of it. So there's what no weak link. Left, there's no weak link what in the party now. Left, what is only left is um, the intended uh, parliamentary and presidential ele elections, which will now fully make us ready for December 2024 with the men and women and the party people that are going to work for that particular victory. And that's, that's, that's why the theme has always been, from the last year till now, rallying for victory, which is to reorganize and rally everybody around that central uh, um, objective of winning power and relieving Ghanaians of all of the hardships they're currently facing. 2020 was a year of hardships for Ghanaians, you just mentioned. In, um, if you look at government's effort at rebuilding the economy, i.e. working, uh, you know, securing the IMF deal, um, you know, institutionalizing austerity measures and all of that. Austerity uh, measures. Yes, austerity <laughs> measures. Why are you laughing? <laughs> Among others. Uh, do we have a positive outlook for 2023? I doubt even if the party people, the keen supporters of the current government, have a positive outlook. You know, and, and, and I say it strongly, you know, in the most strongest terms, that I don't think the party people have the confidence in the current government. They are party people, the MPP party people in the current government. Why do you say that? The mandate. Look, in the last quarter of the year, which politicians across the divide were agitating the most regarding? key and radical changes must, that, that must happen in government. I'm listening. MPP politicians. 80 MPs from parliament made a strong case for the finance minister to be taken out. What was the basis for it? Because according to them, he's failed and they do not have any, any, any um, 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 any hope. They do not have any hope for him and the current government to deliver. But there was a voting. What happened to that? Uh, well, I mean, there are a lot of parliaments. It's a, it's a house of its own rules. Um, parliament did what it did best, but it still doesn't take away the fact that yeah, so they put on key support them, so. relevant members of mm. the party had lost confidence in the current government and had lost confidence in the fact that they cannot actually even deliver the mandate. So is it, is it, doom? So they are not, is it doom for Ghana? What well, the outlook? Like? Well, if you're going to base it on their own party. I mean, there's a saying in um, I can or a very popular African saying that if the crocodile comes out from the pond to tell you that the pond is deep, who are you to argue with the crocodile? These are party people. These are the people that know these, the members, the, the people that form the government, the most more than we know them. But there's an and IMF, these are the people that are part of There's an of IMF the, this policy are, in place, this, you know, austerity measures. So all these won't it's, be jack for Ghana? Well, I mean, the same government can't be trusted when they make austerity measures because it's the same government that have always reneged on that. The same government, look, is this not the same government who do claim that we've been impacted by COVID, Russia and Ukraine, that at its own president, flying expensive same government this is the this is the this is the point where apparently the state the, the world is its in own vulnerable states and a lot of countries were adjusting and cutting and trying to be um put in place austere measures that would help them um reorganize and to be able to forge ahead but this was the time when your president was at his profligate best so again and so definitely don't the president and his government. What is the outlook for this year? That look is doom. That look is doom. Go, go back to all the rating agencies. SNP, Fitch, all of them <laughs> had downgraded Ghana and didn't give us any positive outlook. I mean, at this point, we can only hope and, you know... But the price of fuel reduced a little, you know, we are enjoying some... I mean... Uh, some things now. Again... Going back to the happiness of the same government, mm. we know how this government can engineer and make something this happen and provide a very temporary relief only to bring in a very bitter and hard hardship later on. Go back to 2020, what happened? There was a point in time also because it was an election year where the, the narrative was that we enjoyed free electricity, free water. What, what again? Only for us to pay triple of that in the coming year. Right, but so, Honourable Alan Chamantin recently resigned as the Minister for Trade and Industry. Uh, were you surprised by this decision and have, or what are your impressions as a Minister for um, Trade and Industry? Did he perform well? Resigning and trying to take himself away from them is, isn't going to help him. 
He's a deep and a very bigger part of the mess that we've the experienced. The guy was quiet. Taking I mean, himself away. We didn't hear taking much himself of it. Away. You didn't hear him speak a lot. He was just quite minding his business. The fact that you're quiet doesn't mean... But, but you uh, were, in his ministry look, and working. My question is... You can have an active... Performance. Listen, listen. Um, let me just... Be, you can have an active and a passive participant in a mess. <laughs> you say he was a passive participant because he, could, he, wasn't, he, he wasn't speaking and communicating. Now, that leaves much to be desired. It means that this is one person who, even in the mess, could condone the mess and quietly watch his people, uh, uh, what's it called, execute a mess on all of us. You know, so he's a very deep part of it. Right. He's a part of the economic team that was started as the ones that was going to um, deliver a certain level of magic for us that couldn't deliver so far. And so how do you take him away from that? But, Even if he wasn't the one speaking. Okay, so yeah. he'll be obviously contesting for the flag ownership race. What do you make of his chances, considering that he's likely to compete with, you know, Chris Nani's just as uh, our vice president, Baumia, you know, Kennedy Japan, uh, and all these other people we hear. Do, do you think that he has any chance at it? To be honest, I mean, first and foremost, I, I'm really not interested in anybody that becomes a flag bearer of the MPP. <laughs> Whoever they bring, all I'm interested in is how a be. well organized. You should be because a chairperson the of the Council who, of States of Elders and Pakman Uswajiman also mm -hmm. suggests that Baumia and Alan Ticket to be uh, you know the greatest advantage Look, to the uh, at this MPP. particular point. Is that how you see what, it? What I will NDC be threatened again by such a combination? There's nobody in the MPP today given the very poor leadership and incompetence they've exhibited in the last few years. There's nobody in MPP today that will threaten the chances of NDC coming back to coming back to power in 2024. Nobody. There's nobody. I mean, you know, get down to the streets. The massive expectation of the people is for the NDC to come and relieve Ghanaians from that incompetence we've experienced in the past six or so years. You know, so nobody. And you cannot take away anybody. Any of the names that you mentioned are a strong part of the mess that we experienced. <gasps> Alan Chumantin, Baba, you Dr. are Baumia, right, but you're on exactly? record <laughs> to have said that President Kufado only became, or you know, he became president <laughs> to fulfill his um, long dream, uh, you know, childhood ambitions. As, <laughs> <laughs> well, that has been said very without long, any long. silver lining of purpose. <laughs> Is this a fair statement uh, to make against the president? Because I mean, really and truly, um, I mean, this is a president where. When, is, when the country is experiencing its tough times, he disregards whatever Ghanaians are going through and continues to, I mean, goes about things with complete disregard of the times. Mm. I've indicated to you earlier how during the most vulnerable times in the world, when every country was trying to reorganize, put in place austere measures to uh, reorganize finances and forge ahead. That was the point where he was flying expensive. No, but there's a guy who has a free SHS, fly enjoying free SHS, and aren't you enjoying free SHS? How has it been executed? Mm. Free SHS, by the way. There's and, a national like, cathedral like, which is going to help the nation. Free SHS, by the way, and as has been several said by my party, the initiative is a very good one. The execution of it has been very poor. Look, I've got a teenager that's going to school tomorrow. I mean, my, one of my youngest, uh, one young brothers, one of my doctor brothers, you know, he's going to school tomorrow and I've got to give him almost about six to 700 CDs. Why? Because the PTA of the school came together to say, we cannot wait on the non-delivery of government and have them go through hell in schools. Mm. So we've got to come together to make that contribution to ensure that at least they are able to put, I mean, soul and body together in school and we're able to motivate the teachers to ensure that they they, they, they teach them very well. I mean, the food for the schools are not being delivered on. The debts they are on, they are in arrears for like yeah. months that have not been cleared so, by so the government. If, if, if it's a lot of challenge. If you to raise the current government over 10, what would that ratings be? Uh, wait for Ghanaians to give them that particular measurement. I'm telling you, you want to be MP, so you tell us. So what you said. Do, I, do you want me to say negative Honestly. zero? Negative zero. <laughs> <laughs> well, but finally, if, if you had a chance to serve as a minister. What are the top three ministerial positions you'd be interested in? What's important for me at this particular point is to help in the reorganization of our party to come to power. Most importantly, and topmost on it, is how we're going to capture the Kaipei Central seat one more time.
The last time we won it was over 24 years ago. It's important that the party is able to capture it. The people of Okwakwe Central, having not experienced NDC leadership in the constituency, must now experience that particular transformational leadership that's coming here. I hear you. Thank you so much for talking to me. Thank you very much, too. I've been talking to Baba, it's not fair. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> That's maybe, it for, maybe you should you should wish for the ministry for that you would want tonight, to see tonight, but but you just mentioned information, so you know we're oh, waiting well, for the other well. two. That's it for for tonight. You've been watching the Hard Truth and uh, the founder of Three TV Network and founder of Wider Land Foundation, Baba mm -hmm. Sidi Abdullah, who has been my guest for tonight. Catch a repeat of the program on Saturday at two p.m. My name is Nana Akwesi Afinida Santos. Thank you so much for watching. Good evening.